series of three uh, Advent services. O Come, Emmanuel is the theme throughout Advent and Christmas and even into uh, Epiphany as we uh, are looking at uh, Matthew and Luke's gospel, these uh, very, very important events in the life of our Savior, his uh, birth, and then he, uh, as we know, for our salvation, makes his way uh, to the cross and the uh, empty tomb for our salvation. Uh, we are glad to have uh, folks joining us online as well tonight. Welcome to you, uh, too. Uh, these services will be kind of a mix of old and new songs. Let's stand and sing our first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For centuries, the church has used through Advent a series of antiphons, or responses, to prepare our hearts to celebrate Christ's birth. These seven responses, names and titles for our Savior, are often called the O antiphons, familiar to us in the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We light the first candle on the Advent wreath in praise to Christ, who is the wisdom of God. The Apostle John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made. The Apostle Paul writes, For by Christ all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. O wisdom, O holy word of God, you govern all creation with your strong yet tender care. Let us now confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. O oh, Almighty God, you rule over us in wisdom, but we, your servants, do not always act wisely. Foolishly, we listen to the temptations of the devil and the world around us. We follow our own selfish desires. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. Have mercy on us and forgive us. 
God in his mercy sent his Son to be our Savior and our wisdom. Jesus laid down his life and rose from the dead to win for us forgiveness and life. I announce to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O wisdom, O holy word of God, rule over us and keep us in your care. We sing. be seated for the children's message. Well, hello to all of you here and to those of you joining us online. Um, I'm not sure if you've been able to notice yet, but our service today is based on a special word, and that word for today is wisdom. So I brought something with me today that um, some people would say has to do with wisdom. Does anybody know what this might be? Yes, this is a diploma. And so people who finish a certain study, whether it's high school or college or a master's degree, doctorate, earn a very special piece of paper that looks all fancy, has signatures on it and everything, called a diploma. And so people like teachers and doctors and lawyers and pastors and some church workers have diplomas, and it's just a piece of paper to kind of show that um, you know some things, and those things that you know help you do the work that you um, have prepared to do and have passed lots and lots of tests. So Jesus, our Savior, he never had a diploma but he is the one who knows more than anyone else in the whole entire world. So Jesus is God, and he knows everything. And we have some special names for Jesus, don't we? We call him our King, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Good Shepherd. And another name that we have for Jesus is Wisdom. He is our Wisdom. He knows everything, and he not only knows everything, but he uses that knowledge to prepare things for us, rule over us, and protect us in our lives um, for everything, every situation. He always knows what's right, and he always does what's right also, even when we can't understand it, because we don't have that same wisdom that God does. Even people with diplomas don't have that same kind of wisdom. So God is always there with us, always ruling on our behalf, and loves us more than we can ever imagine. Let's pray together. Okay, let's fold our hands, and would you please repeat after me? Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for being our wisdom. We know that you will take care of us and wisely rule over us today, tomorrow, and forever. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
this Advent season. We are blessed to have our children involved in worship, and Grace Volsky will be our reader tonight. Our first reading is from Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your th thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields the seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out and enjoy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn brush will grow the juniper, and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. For this be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God in the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Please stand for the gospel reading. Our gospel reading is from Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of law. Come, Emmanuel, God with us. Come among us. Bless us with your presence, with your word, with your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I wouldn't uh, imagine, unless you are an astronomer, that this image uh, means anything to you. But uh, this image, uh, taken by the Hubble telescope, made possible through this quirk of nature, um, more accurately uh, how God designed things, called gravitational lensing, enables us to see this distant blue star far, far away. It's called Icarus. Perhaps you have heard of it. That's its official name, uh, a little uh, cumbersome, I think you would agree. Icarus uh, works better for the name of this star. It's only about nine billion light years away, give or take, right? 
It's out there a ways. It's amazing that we have equipment uh, that can send images back to us so that we can see it even this clearly. So the question then emerges, how high are the heavens above the earth? That language is used in the Bible. When you, when you think about Icarus, uh, you have to say, well, that's a long way out there. I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to send anybody quite that far out there. And, and those who study such things say that that might be about halfway across the universe, nine billion light Years. It's so vast it uh, boggles the mind. So we hear these words from Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We just got a glimpse there of how high the heavens are above the earth where we're standing Christmas is coming, and we ask the question, well, what's it all about? Every year we come to this time where there's a flurry of activity, and people are busy, but what are they busy doing? What is it really all about? Maybe you remember the Grinch saying this, maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store, maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more, right? The gospel according to St. Grinch, right? That's uh, a clue, at least, that there's more to Christmas than what we do uh, shopping at a store. God says this through his servant Isaiah, as the rain, the snow come down from heaven, uh, don't return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, But it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. How many times have we heard those words? Maybe heard sermons on those words, studies on those words, ran across it in our reading of Isaiah. Powerful words indeed. Words of hope, words of promise, words of wisdom here certainly. It's interesting when you look at this story and how profound it is, how interesting it is that God would come down to our level. That's what makes Christianity unique in the world of religions. No other religion talks about God coming to us. All other religions talk about how people can make their way somehow to God. But God humbled himself in the person of Jesus and came down to our level, and probably a lower level than, than any of us have ever lived. You remember what Jesus said, the foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, no place to lay his head. At least tonight we will have a, a, a pillow uh, on which to lay our head. Maybe you've seen this a while back. How many of you remember that commercial? The E.F. Hutton commercials where everybody just stops, right? Everybody stops and listens because they want to know what this uh, uh, broker has to say, right? Well, imagine if the world stopped like that for the Word of God. Like every time somebody said, well, this is what God's Word says, and everybody just stopped and listened. Boy, the world would probably be a different place if we gave ear to what God had to say when God speaks. What happens when God speaks? What happens when his word goes forth? Well, we just read about that in Isaiah 55. God's word has a way, has a power to accomplish the things that God intends. Like in the beginning, you've read that verse many times. God said, let there be light, and there was Light. He called everything into being by his almighty word, his powerful word. He spoke and everything came into being. 
So there's the sun and the earth and the moon. It's really interesting to consider how this solar system is put together, let alone this vast universe all the way out to Icarus and beyond. But God spoke, and, uh, and the sun found its place, the earth as well. He fashioned all of it, a greater light during the day to govern the day, a lesser light at night, speaking of the moon and all the other planets. I've heard uh, these folks that are quite well-versed and well-studied talk about diplomas. Uh, the gentleman that I'm thinking about, I think, has three PhDs, and he's an astrophysicist. And he says that if all of the planets in our solar system weren't aligned just exactly the way that they are by the Creator, we would not be experiencing life on this planet, that all of it fits together. What does an astrophysicist say thank you to God for at his dinner table? I've heard him say. When his family's gathered together, they thank the Lord for the sun, and the moon, and Saturn, and Venus, and they go through the planets because that's how his mind works. Thank you, God, for putting this together so we can have life here on this planet. This uh, is a psalm that might have escaped you. I had forgotten about this word from God's word. God determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. We remember Noah naming the animals. I mean, uh, uh, Adam naming the animals. Uh, I don't know if Noah had time to think about the names of the animals. But Adam named the animals, we are told, but God has names for the stars. Now, I don't know if he named uh, uh, that uh, star that we just looked at, the big blue one out there nine billion light years away, Icarus. Uh, we call it that. He's probably got another name for it. He knows. It's his creation. We know that God's word works. It has power in and of itself. We see that even in the life and ministry of Jesus. All he would have to do sometimes is just to say a word and things would happen. Peace be still, he said to the Sea of Galilee, and the wind stopped and the waves were silenced. Our Heavenly Father who created all that exists sent his word into the world. Not, not just a spoken word, but a, a word that actually is a person. The word made flesh, as we know. Uh, John speaks of Jesus that way. The word of God that took on human form. Flesh and blood, uh, quite weak looking there. Uh, baby uh, in, a, in a manger, s so helpless indeed, so dependent on others for his well-being in that stage of life like the rest of us. And we would look at all of that and we'd say, man, that's a, a, a curious plan. We might even say, this is a hard message to take out there to the streets. It seems kind of far-fetched that there's a God out there, created everything, but, but then he came here. Uh, and, and he came not as a, a prince or a king on a, on a stallion. No, he came as a baby, uh, as helpless as babies are. And then when he finally came to do what he came to do, he, he waltzes into town on the back of a donkey. This does not seem proper. doesn't seem like the, the right kind of spin on a story about God coming to save us. Maybe we would write the script differently, but our thoughts are not his thoughts. Uh, his ways are quite different than our ways, right? God's thoughts, uh, uh, they're up there. They're lofty. They're different. They're unfathomable, really. They're beyond us, and yet he makes it so understandable with words, right? In 66 books in a Bible, Many words there. Some people get all kind of tangled up in all of those words or find it hard to make it through that story of the Bible. But yet it is a unified message of words that point to a person, uh, the Savior of the world, come to rescue us from sin and death and the power of the devil. It's really quite a spectacular story. I mean, it's, it's amazing what God has done, all motivated by his love 
for us indeed. So we look again in these days into the manger, right? We probably have manger scenes, nativities around home. Some of you may have vast collections and you're excited every year to, to get them out and hope that not too much broke in the, in the box in the meantime, you know, when you put it away or got it back out. And you, with love, you put these out for your family to see, for others who might come visiting to see this scene again, this humble scene, Bethlehem. That song, Mary, did you know, right? Did you know that your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? Well, how could she really understand that at that moment, having this child looking at this baby she's holding in her arms? This is the Lord of creation. This little one spoke and the universe leapt into existence. I'm not sure she was having thoughts like that. Maybe she was just thinking quite simply, i got to take care of this baby. Is, is he okay? Is everything going to be all right? Boy, these are crude surroundings. Maybe she didn't think about that at all with the joy of bringing this child now into the world. When you look at this baby in the manger, what do you, what do you think? Power? There's God's power? Mm, no, it looks more like a, a weak, a weakling, a little helpless child uh, uh, born in, in a place like that. Uh, and nothing bespeaks power about that situation, we might say. It was Luke who wrote that this little one, he grew, right? He didn't stay a baby long, like our babies don't stay babies very long. They grow up very fast, and he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He grew, and he had a mission. He came on a mission, and he was headed that direction this whole time. From eternity, in fact, a long trip, if you will. Uh, we don't measure it in, uh, in light years. No, it's a different kind of measuring system. It's called kairos. At uh, just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us who were under that law, that we might be adopted as God's dear children. We remember what was said about Jesus when he became a teacher at age 30, three years of public ministry, teaching as a rabbi. They called him rabbi. They called him teacher, and no greater teacher has ever taught on the planet. And as Trish reminded us, he had no diploma, didn't need one. He knew everything there was to know, yet humbled himself, was kind of choosy about uh, uh, playing the divine card, although he did plenty with miracles that astounded us, even raising the dead. The things that came out of his mouth, the people wonder, well, where is this coming from? How does he have authority to say these things? Well, his authority was of himself. He came from the Father. He came with the message. He himself is the Word. He is the message of the kingdom of God. Back to those words, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord. How, how real that is, how true that is. Even uh, in these days when we sort of scratch our head and we kind of uh, uh, moan under the weight of things that are going on in our world, not the least of which is this pandemic and other things that might just weigh heavy on us. And yet... We look at this God and we trust Him. He's got things well in hand. He who created all that exists, holds it together by His power, certainly will see us through whatever challenges we might be facing and see us through to heaven, right? Uh, I don't know if we can get there through light years. No, it's a different kind of transport on that day by the power of God when time gives way to eternity. God says, my word will not return to me empty. It'll accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This grisly scene on Good Friday, that's why the word became flesh, to die for us. Again, a curious plan. Why did it have to be that way? But yet, blood had to be shed to redeem us, to buy us back, to pay the price 
for mankind's sins. The plan of salvation, would we have uh, planned it out that way? Mm, Probably not. We probably have different kind of ideas about how to pull that off. Paul talks about it, right? We heard these words too, 1 Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified. Now that's a, a stumbling block to Jews. It's nonsense to Gentiles, right? This notion of Christ, uh, your leader, your teacher, your Messiah is dying on a cross. Uh, that's your message. Um, that doesn't make any sense. Who, who'd want to follow somebody like that who died a criminal's death on a cross? This baby, something else, right? This, this little child coming into the world just to end up there on the cross some 33 years later. So cruel. He never did anything wrong. He was the most wonderful person to have ever been on the planet, right? And this is how he gets treated? Well, our sins put him there. Not so much Romans, but the sins of mankind and the love of God. His own love for us put him there. We know that story. Where is the one who is wise, Paul asks. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The world thinks it's so wise. The Greeks were looking for wisdom And along comes God with his son, the word made flesh. Looks like foolishness, but that's where true wisdom is found. And that's where power is found in the weakest of moments, in the manger and on the cross. Common denominator there seems to be wood, right? Crude, rough wood. Also a creation of God, right? Trees used for divine purposes. Icarus, well, I I tell you to go home tonight and get your telescope out, but you're just not going to see it, right? Uh, It doesn't work that easily not to see this particular star, but we've got stars we can see. And the next time you look up, think about the power of God and the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the majesty of God. And that he placed every one of those stars there, has names for them. He cares for his creation, most of all cares for us with a love that just never ends. When it comes to wisdom, I looked up the exponential growth of information. This is a fascinating number. You've heard of the debt clock. How many of you heard of the debt clock in New York, right? It just keeps ticking. I mean, it's probably hot. It spins so fast, right? The debt clock. And this is an information clock, if you will, tracking the bits of information, right? Bits and bytes, if you will. This number is really hard to even pronounce or even categorize. It's 3.4 sextillion is the number. and This is the information since 2013, an exponential growth of information. I don't know if you've ever seen all these uh, bytes, right? From kilobytes down to zettabytes at the bottom. Uh, And I've uh, just read today that the exabytes are up to like seven uh, comma so-and-so, right? Uh, At this particular time. Because it's like the dead clock. It just keeps rolling. Information. A lot of people look at information and, and the internet and Wikipedia and all that can be at your fingertips and say, now this is the knowledge and wisdom of the world. If I only could grasp these things and yet they could have their head full of all of that. And know so much and yet know so little, really, if they don't know Jesus. Because he is wisdom. If you want wisdom, you got to look to God. you got to look to Jesus for wisdom. Knowledge, Paul says, puffs up in that, uh, in that uh, eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians. He says, love, it builds up. Talks similar kind of language in 1 Corinthians 13, as you might remember, love greater than knowledge or wisdom. Christ, the power of God, 
the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God stronger than men, Paul says. Familiar words to us. Well, we're headed to the manger again. That scene, that quiet scene, that holy night, that silent night, shepherds coming, witnessing, the first to witness, the angel's voice, for unto you is born this day. We're going to rehearse all of that, look at all of that once again, and and make our way as children back to that manger to peer in there and look at the face of God. God. It actually is a king-sized bed. doesn't look that big, but a king went in that bed, the king of all creation. Back to the song, right? Mary, did you know when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God? Amazing. He determines the number of stars. He, he gives names to all of them, this little one in a manger. Amazing. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word, your word that doesn't return empty but accomplishes everything that you send it to do, especially the word made flesh, Jesus the Christ. In these Advent days, Lord, may we pause often uh, to look again at that scene uh, in Bethlehem, that, that manger in which was placed the word come down from heaven to save us, to buy us back from sin and death and the power of the devil. We thank you, Lord, for your love, which is greater than knowledge or wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn verse of response. seated. This time we'll have our offering time. Um, We have baskets in the back of the sanctuary for those who are here. If you're online or if you'd like to use your electronic device here in the sanctuary, you can give online. There's options on the screen uh, as well as uh, a URL at which you can register your attendance and give us any prayer requests. Please stand for the prayers. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you are for us the power of God and the wisdom of God. We pray that you will help us to grow in wisdom according to your word. Lead us to build our lives and hope on your word and promises. You came among us in weakness. Yet in that weakness was found all the power and wisdom of God for our salvation. Use us to reach out to those among us who are suffering illness, loss, and need. Give us opportunities to share your love with them through our kind and caring words and actions. Help us by your Spirit to be bold witnesses for you, to share with an unbelieving world that you are the wisdom of God and the power of God for our salvation and theirs. As we prepare to celebrate your birth, lead us to look into the manger with eyes of faith and to recognize you there as the wisdom and power of God. Amen. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before our closing song. Uh, Poinsettia sign-up sheets are still in the atrium if you'd like to help decorate our sanctuary with those. Uh, Congregational assembly is this Sunday at noon in person or via Zoom, uh, and call the church office to register for Zoom. And church directories are available for pickup in the atrium if you have not uh, received yours yet. God bless your week. Let's sing our closing song. Lifted high in praise, and it's you we adore. We're singing what kids say nowadays kitten of truth write that down yeah well, it hasn't made it to the grade school <laughs> little kitten of truth I guess it's a thing from one of their shows I don't know what show yeah But you have to remember, my kids are also um, carrying around like baby, plastic baby, like the ones that go in King's Cake, the tiny little plastic Jesuses. So one girl came to school with them as earrings. Jennifer? 
are you wearing baby Jesus on your, on your ears? She was like, yeah, do you like him? She was like, what did you call him? I was like, nothing. Nothing. And I was like, have you ever heard of King's Cake? And she goes, no. I'm like, have a good day. I'll see you, I'll see you next hour, Jennifer. <laughs> but they're like, she has like studs, the tiny little plastic babies. So I was like, I can't judge. Uh, and I'm only 10 years in. I feel like it's going to just get worse. <clears throat> you what? Good for you. Yeah.